Okay, everyone, we're going to get started. Thank you for that. Uh, thanks for being here. I think this is the last event of the day. If I can, yes, it is. I'm getting some nods in the affirmative. Uh, I'm Chris Berry. I'm a staff attorney at the Animal Legal Defense Fund, and I'll be moderating the, the last panel here, uh, Europe Leads the Way to a Brighter Future for Animals. Uh, a topic that I'm excited to learn about because I have to confess I, I know very little about it. Uh, we have two, uh, I think, wonderful speakers today. Uh, first will be Adam Roberts. He's the CEO with Born Free USA and uh, Born Free Foundation in the United Kingdom. And they uh, focus on wildlife advocacy uh, and do a lot of great work for uh, both captive and, and wild wildlife around the world. Um, Adam has two decades of experience with international wildlife trade and captive animal issues. He's also on the board of directors for the Species Survival Network, and he's a founding member and current chairman of the board for the Global Federation of Animal Sanctuaries, uh, which is known in the animal protection community as really being the gold standard for determining what a legitimate sanctuary, um, how it conducts itself. So I think that's uh, wonderful what you did there. Our second speaker is uh, Marita Candela, and she is a, a pioneer of Spanish, European, and international animal law. She works at the Universitat Autonoma de Barcelona, which I probably bot botched the pronunciation of, where she started teaching animal law in 2006, uh, well ahead of the curve. She's also a, a director of several impressive things, including both the postgraduate and the masters in animal law and society programs at the Universitat, and the, uh, the uh, Derecho Animal Web Center, uh, which was, uh, she founded in 2010. She also organized the second global animal law conference uh, in Barcelona, which was held in 2011. And, uh, I thought it was really interesting. Also has a background in classical antiquity legal issues, including Roman law and uh, slavery and how that applies to animals. So uh, looking forward to hearing from both of you. Thanks. I'm going to go ahead and use the stool. Uh, thank you very much. Can you hear me in the back OK? Yep. Good, thank you. Thumbs up. I like it and thumbs up. Uh, thank you, Christopher. I realized from your introduction there when you mentioned that you uh, were looking forward to this panel so you could learn a little bit about EU policy, that you and I have that in common. I, too, am looking forward to hearing <laughs> and learning about EU policy. Uh, first, let me start with a couple of disclaimers and apologies, uh, the first of which is that normally uh, when we get to the very last panel at a conference like this, especially on a Sunday morning with so much going on, I would congratulate you all for your dedication as animal advocates so interested in this engaging subject that we have before us today. And then I realized that Nancy Perry was doing a panel a minute ago, and perhaps that's why you all stuck around. And then I realized vegan donuts. So uh, thank you nonetheless. Uh, the second embarrassing thing, let me just say that uh, in preparation for the next 20 minutes, is that uh, I was sick yesterday. I say that to apologize to those people who I very much wanted to hear and learn from, but couldn't. Uh, my 11-year-old daughter was sick, passed it on to my wife, who then, before I got on the plane Friday, passed it on to me. And I only say that for two reasons. One is if this goes terribly badly, I have a built-in excuse that you all knew about in advance. And secondly, just to know that a grown man can indeed throw his wife and daughter under the bus. Um, Third embarrassing thing, let me just say now, I've already discussed the timekeeping issue, and I said, where's the timekeeper going to be? And when she was pointed out, I said, that's great, because I really don't care, I won't check. And then Liberty was kind enough to tell me, don't worry, and I quote, there's nothing really happening after this. So if we go a little long, not my fault. And lastly is the topic of today's discussion, which I apologize in advance, Europe leads the way to a brighter future for animals. I will do my very best, having been invited to speak about this engaging concept, to do so in my cherished Franco-Italian accent that shows how much I am engaged in the European Union, um, because of course I'm not. But having run Born Free USA for 10 years, and as Christopher alluded to, been involved in the animal protection movement in Washington, D.C. for 25 years, I've now been at the helm of Born Free Foundation, based in the United Kingdom, for the past two years. And I've started to get a little sense of what's happening in the European Union. And the reason why 
the uh, question mark is added at the end of the topic on the presentation today is that when I thought about this subject and it was presented to me as a declarative statement that the European Union does in fact lead the way to a brighter future for animals, I couldn't help but think about this question because I realized that for many, many years since I started doing this type of work so long ago, I've always felt that way and maybe you all have too and I don't presume to know the answer of whether the U.S. is a leader in animal protection, the European Union. I think from time to time we have a tendency to feel that that's the case. I've always looked to Europe and thought to myself, they're doing amazing things on factory farming, they're doing amazing things on the fur trade and regulations on humane trapping standards and imports of fur. But then I think, well look at what India is doing on circuses and getting rid of the dancing sloth bears as some of you probably heard about a few minutes ago from Kartik. And look at what Israel is doing on primates and biomedical research laboratories. So maybe this isn't necessarily a declarative statement, but it's a question. Is Europe really leading, or are there things that we can learn, lessons that we can learn from each other in order to have the most global impact for animals that we can? And given that Born Free's work is entirely international in nature, um, although we do have obviously domestic national programs, uh, I think it's really important to learn from each other and see what we can do for animals. So with that said, I'm going to take a few minutes to talk about a few of the things that we do. Uh, the first is I'm going to give you a little bit of background about the organization. I hate to use precious time for that, so we'll take it out of Marita's time. But um, <laughs> you guys are so good. Um, I am going to talk a little bit about Born Free because quite frankly, as I look around this room, I realize that Professor Favor and I are probably the only two who remember Born Free the film and might actually know <laughs> how Born Free came about and the fact that I can see the older folks laughing and all the swath of young people not laughing says to me I was right on the money with that one. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit structurally about the European Union and, and again compare and contrast how the EU works and how the US and perhaps others work and then give two case studies because you're all lawyers or law students and therefore you like the phrase case studies, right? Um, so I'm going to do two case studies, one about wild animals in captivity and the other on wildlife in trade, you know, rhino poaching for their horns and elephant ivory and tiger bone and all the rest. Um, and let me just say one thing as well, as, as I think about this question, I think about evolution, right? And, and that is a reason that it's actually good that there are so many young faces in this room because as we evolve in our thinking about animals and therefore evolve in our application of animal related policies and regulations and laws, I think it's really important to take a long view to all of this. I mean, I've been around for a long time and a few of us have, um, but it's going to take a long time to make sure that, these that the application of these changes are indeed global. And so it's really good that you all are here and I, I do indeed thank you for sticking it out to the end. Um, so first, just a little bit about Born Free. So some of you may have heard the film Born Free. I can't go to a bar anywhere in America without mentioning Born Free and having people start to hum the song, which I'm not doing now. Uh, but in the 1966 film Born Free, the story was told of George Adamson and Joy Adamson, George the Kenya park warden and his naturalist and artist wife Joy. Uh, George had to kill a quote unquote problem lion and then found out she had three cubs took those cubs in, two of them went into captivity, and one of them that they named Elsa, they decided to keep, rehabilitate, and release back into the wild. And so Born Free was this amazing story um, with Bill Travers, the actor playing George Adamson, and Virginia McKenna, his wife, real life wife, playing Joy Adamson. And they told the story of Elsa, her remarkable reintroduction back into the wild, but it wasn't actually the nature of the film or the making of the film or the acclaim of the film that led to the creation of the organization. It was actually something that happened a few years later when Bill and Virginia went back to Africa to do a follow-up film, sort of a comical documentary called An Elephant Called Slowly. And it was about them going back, having had this film be very successful, and they met up with this small group of adolescent elephants, and these were troublemaking elephants, and one of them was named in Swahili Poli Poli, which meant slowly, slowly, and this is her. She was two years old at the time of the film. And after the making of the film, the government of Kenya, bless their hearts, decided that they were going to take this elephant and send her as a diplomatic gift to England to live in the London Zoo to thank the folks for making this film and calling such great attention to the wildlife of Kenya. Well, of course, at this point now, Bill and Virginia had become very interested in wildlife conservation, wildlife protection, and wanted very much to keep Poli Poli from going into a zoo for the rest of her life. Now, of course, everyone in this room surely knows that African elephants in the wild will live to their 50s, 60s, 70s. They're in matriarchal herds with grandmothers, daughters, granddaughters, aunts, nieces, cousins, all living together, but she, at two, was going to go. And the only option for her not going was that they they capture another elephant in her stead. So she went as two years old to the London Zoo and this is where she ended up living. This very concrete and steel structure, most of her life was spent living alone 
She, like many elephants in captivity, developed stereotypic behavior, swaying back and forth, literally going insane from the captivity, and ultimately developing significant foot problems by the time she was 12, 13, 14 years old. And it came out in the news that she was going to have to be euthanized as a result of these foot problems, which happens all too often in zoos all across the planet. And so Bill and Virginia decided they wanted to do something to try and stop this premature killing of this young elephant who obviously didn't deserve to die in captivity. They mounted a small campaign to try and, if not get her back to Africa, which was not possible at the time, especially because of her fragile health, to get her to a better facility, comparatively, somewhere in Europe. And that failed, and at 14, 14, she had to be put down. But before then, Bill and Virginia went back to see her one last time, having not seen her for more than a decade. And they walked through the throng of people outside her enclosure. And Bill, his hair and beard completely turning from brown to gray, called her name and reached out his hand. And she went right up to him, reached directly out to him, having remembered him from that time. So that's what led to the organization known as Zucek, which eventually in 1984 uh, led to Born Free Foundation in the United Kingdom and 20 years later Born Free USA here. So it's really important, I think, that we think about our heritage, which actually involves wildlife and captivity, wildlife trade, and both of those, those things related to what's happening in Europe. So we help wildlife around the world in a number of ways. We look at animal welfare zoos, circuses, dolphin area, but also protect species in the wild. And I think this is incredibly important because all too often we hear about the great conservation benefit of zoos, for example, what they're doing to benefit wildlife in the wild, when really I think they're not doing enough, far be it from enough, but we're actually working on the ground like many other organizations to protect wildlife in the wild where they belong. But we not only do conservation work and animal welfare work, we also rescue individual animals in need, such as Dolo here, found emaciated with no mane, ribs showing in Ethiopia, got him to a sanctuary at our, our rescue center in Ethiopia where he could live out his remaining days in peace. And we campaign on global wildlife trade issues such as elephant ivory and the things I discussed before. But then also we take a sort of a human approach, a proactive approach to these issues, looking at safeguarding local communities and dealing with human-animal conflict. For example, building lion-proof bomas in the Maasai Mara so that livestock herders can put their animals in at night, which means lions aren't killing the cattle. And if lions aren't killing the cattle, there's not dangerous poisoning, really cruel poisoning, retaliatory killing of the lions by the cattle owners. And then we also do Traveler's Animal Alert, where we ask people who go around the world and look at actual exhibits when they go on safari or they go to a zoo or they go on um, a cruise to tell us about the things they find that's wrong. So we have projects all over the world. And as I say, one of the things I notice about this conference as I come to it after a few years away is how global we really are, looking at Jill Robinson on bears or, as I mentioned before, Kartik and others. So this all leads me to the question of, uh, again, is it true that Europe leads the way for a brighter future for animals? And, you know, I think we've made incredible strides in America in the way that we've looked at these issues. Um, and I, I think about the change in the past, say, 50 years, right? And for better or worse, I know that all these laws could do with improvements. But I look at America, and I think we've got the Endangered Species Act, the Marine Mammal Protection Act, the Humane Methods of Slaughter Act, the Animal Welfare Act, the Wild Bird Conservation Act, the Captive Wildlife Safety Act. We've done some pretty significant and amazing things for a very large country at the federal level when we think about having 50 individual states that might very well want different laws within those states. And obviously, the Congress, as you all well know, has certain limitations about the way they can implement that. Well, similarly, uh, in the European Union, you have a situation where there is no overriding European law. There are regulations that are passed, policies that can be enacted, policies that can be approved by the European Parliament, by the European Commission, uh, and that the 28 member states are beholden to, and don't ask me to name the 28 member states because I will not be able to, um, but individual countries implement those regulations. And you're going to have very disparate ways that those regulations are implemented from state to state. So one thing that I found very interesting in preparing for this discussion, and I should add um, that, again, when I asked my colleagues in the United Kingdom office, uh, Mark Jones, who does wildlife trade, and Daniel Turner, who does animals in captivity and deals with the European Parliament, I asked them to help me prepare this talk. And by that, I mean I asked them to prepare this talk. They, um, they came back to me and they, they actually questioned the title. And what they came to me wa with was not the EU leads the way, but th the title for the talk they had was addressing the bottleneck 
in Europe. So the way it's seen from that perspective is quite frankly different than the way many of us might see it, which is that they're trying so desperately to do things and are hindered all the way along in doing so. So one of the interesting things I found was that in Article 13 of the Treaty on the Functioning of Europe that's implemented through the U, um, European Parliament is, is this, and you know, I highlighted the one important phrase, that there's this overarching concept that animals are sentient beings, which I would assume everyone in this room agrees with, and that everything that we do, we being the European, par or the European member states, European Union member states, should pay full regard to the requirements of animals, right? Their behavioral needs, their biological needs, their physical needs, social needs, all of this. And I thought that was particularly interesting. When Daniel sent this to me, he highlighted that part of the paragraph. But you all, being smart lawyers, may have found something else particularly interesting about this paragraph, at least I did, which was the very last sentence that's not highlighted, which said, notwithstanding our desire to protect these animals from all these cruel things that all these people do to animals, we also have to respect the administrative provisions and customs of member states, including religious rights, cultural traditions, and religious heritage, or regional heritage. And so the first thing I thought of as a, as a person who pays attention to language is, it seems to me that that last sentence changes everything about the part in bold, right? Because every bullfight is a cultural tradition, and zoos and circuses, you know, my family has had this circus in Latvia for 60 years, that is a cultural tradition. So that perhaps could be used to challenge anything that's intended to do good things for animal welfare. Now, it doesn't seem to have been the case yet, and I probably shouldn't say it out loud because I don't want to give them any ideas, but except for bullfighting, this hasn't really been applied. So in the European Union right now, you have a situation where it's generally respected that animals, including in zoos and live animals in trade, deserve to have their well-being attended to, and that individual member states are obligated, they're obliged to uphold their responsibilities toward animal welfare. Now, how does this happen? So in the European Parliament, which is not dissimilar from the United States government, where we have many different departments trying to identify how to best protect animals, you have all these competencies being addressed by different directorate generals, and you've got some of them listed here. So you've got directorate generals that are responsible for health and human safety and food safety and home affairs and the environment and trade and even finances all having their hand just a little bit in animal welfare and conservation issues. And of course, as I say, that's not dissimilar from what we have in the United States, where you have the Department of the Interior looking at wildlife trade, both international trade, endangered species protection, uh, and other things related to domestic and international wildlife, while you've got the Department of Agriculture looking at food safety, but also animal welfare in zoos and circuses, or trying to anyway, uh, looking at exhibitors, Class B exhibitors, Class C exhibitors, uh, class B dealers, excuse me, Class C exhibitors, you have all these different agencies looking at these issues. So what does that create? It creates a problem where animal welfare is the responsibility of all of these departments, but the different departments look at animal welfare very differently. And it's very similar, again, to what we have in the United States. So here, uh, DG Sante, which is the only one, the one that deals with health and food safety, is the only one that actually has a policy, a department, a unit that looks at animal welfare issues. And so overall, the European Commission, that wasn't a joke. Okay. Um, the, European, the, European, the European Commission um, says that animal welfare is a matter for subsidiary, subsidiarity and proportionality. And what that means is we're going to look first at the legal implications in each member state and let them essentially police themselves. And then secondly, and this is the most important for us on proportionality, looking at the things that matter most based on the number of animals exploited, which of course is always going to be things like animals raised for food and not animals raised in zoos or kept in circuses. So we did a questionnaire at Born Free of the individual member states where we tried to sort of identify what was really going on, what their challenges were uh, in the individual member states. And we found that member states decided that they actually lacked the competency in the member states to enforce the EU regulations. So they didn't understand how to enforce, they couldn't interpret the laws, and they actually were looking for leadership on this regard. And one of the things that we advocated was what we called a one-stop shop, where all of the concepts of law and regulation and enforcement can be put into one place that all member state legal authorities can tap into in order to try and do better at enforcing the law. We tried something similar in the United States where we came up with this idea of an animal protection commission a few years ago, and even had a member of the United States Congress in, uh, introduce legislation 
to introduce an animal protection commission so that we would not have this fox guarding the hen house approach where you've got people who used to work for the NRA and the Safari Club making decisions at Department of Interior and people who used to work in the ag industry making decisions about animal welfare in the Department of Agriculture. So again, we're moving these things forward. Now, I mentioned sort of two specific case studies. One, of course, is on animals in captivity. And one of the things we found through our zoo inquiry that looked at 200 different zoos around the uh, European Union is that many of them had animals languishing in poor conditions. So there are about 3,500 zoos across Europe, and 260 of them or so are actually accredited by IAZA. Now, for reference, in the United States, you've got about 2,300 zoos that are licensed by the USDA, and about 10% of those are actually accredited by AZA. And so we looked at whether these zoos are actually implementing the European Union directive on zoos and found, again, that the majority of them are not implementing the regulation and leaving it up to the individual member states to sort of allow the zoos to self-police because they didn't understand or have the ability, the enforcement capabilities, to do better. And the same thing happens for captive marine mammals, cetacea, where 32 of the 33 facilities across Europe, most of them in Spain and Italy, that have marine mammals are actually accredited by IAZA and are supposed to be conforming to IAZA regulations and therefore the um, European Zoo Directive. Similarly, in the United States, the Georgia Aquarium, SeaWorld, world are accredited by AZA, and theoretically you'd have the same level of competency, but what we found again is that they don't simply because they're not capable of enforcing those EU rules. The second case study is on wildlife trade, which is the thing I've worked about most, most throughout my career, and it's particularly interesting to look at the European Union in this context, because the European Union, thank you, um, has actually become a party to the Convention on International Trade and Endangered Species. I think it's the 181st party. Now, all 28 member states are members of CITES or parties to CITES, but as a regional economic integration organization, now the EU is a party as well. And the reason I say this is interesting is because for many years, and this helps us look at the sort of trajectory of wildlife protection globally, um, the U.S. was a very strong leader at CITES meetings advocating for wildlife. And then eventually what happened over time is the pendulum swung away from the United States to African states who said that we want to have a greater voice and a greater stake in protecting our wildlife. And the U.S. kind of took a back seat in the leadership role, and what's emerged out of that now is that the EU, because all 28 members vote as a bloc at CITES, is that the EU is incredibly powerful. And this is where this concept of leading the way doesn't necessarily mean it's positive. For instance, when the 28 member states all get in a room at a CITES meeting, they have to come to a common agreement about whether they're going to vote yes, no, or abstain on a proposal. Now at CITES, help me if I'm wrong, David, uh, in order for a proposal to change the listing of a species to increase protection or decrease protection, you need two-thirds of a vote of those casting a vote. That means yes or no, not abstaining. And so if you have 28 member states of the European Union all abstaining because they can't come to a common agreement, it changes the threshold and makes the no blocking minority much easier to achieve. So when, for example, at the last CITES meeting, there was an attempt to raise the level of protection for polar bears, and Denmark is in the EU, and Greenland is a protectorate of Denmark, and they hunt polar bears, Denmark was able to create a scenario in which they advocated for voting no on the polar bear proposal. There was no common ground in the EU, so they all abstained, except for Denmark, who voted no, even though you're not supposed to, and I don't know what happened as a result. But nonetheless, as a result of those 28 votes, many of which would have voted yes for the polar bears, being completely taken out of, off the table, the polar bear proposal was defeated. So it does show that there's some incredible power in what the EU can do on wildlife trade. And I just added this line because I found it very interesting for all the things I say I don't know and, and all those jokes I make. When the press release went out from the CITES Secretariat about the EU acceding to CITES and becoming the 181st party, the first thing I thought as a guy who doesn't know very much is, what does that mean? Does it mean the EU can cast a vote? Does it e mean the EU can have a representative at the Standing Committee of CITES that looks at implementation or the Animals Committee that looks at science? And there was this interesting line saying that the Secretariat will provide parties with guidance about the practical effects in due course. So perhaps I'm not the only one who didn't really have a clue what that meant. 
But uh, as my time is up, as we move these things along, I think we do have some incredible things happening in the EU. And again, I try and couch that by talking about what's happening elsewhere. So in the United States, you have this incredible effort right now where you've got a presidential advisory council on wildlife trafficking. You've got executive orders on wildlife trafficking. You've got a wildlife alliance. You've got the State Department looking at how we can use lessons learned in the narcotics trade to fight the wildlife trade, really elevating the game when it comes to international wildlife trade. And now in the European Union as well, you have MEPs for wildlife, members of parliament who are actually looking at enforcement of wildlife trade, how to make the regulations stricter to stop wildlife trade from coming into the European Union, which of course has a significant number of animals and plants coming in, more than 100 different CITES species, numbering about 12,000 trophies a year, are going into the European Union. So this is an incredibly important issue to them, especially when we're talking about essentially a multi-billion dollar industry. So that leads me to conclusions, which I'm going to skip because you all are smart enough to catch it all the way through. And I'm just going to close with this, which is really not about the European Union, but it is about sort of how we can use this integrated approach to save animals. And because it's just happened and it was related to the European Union, I'll mention it. Uh, this is Jora and Black. There are two lions. They were the last two lions in Bulgaria in a circus. And Bulgaria... Uh, did an amazing thing and stopped the use of wild animals in circuses. And so Jorah and Black were left to languish in this metal beast wagon. Uh, summer was approaching where they would have been very hot, probably had ac little access to water. And so we decided to work with the Bulgarian authorities because of our influence in the EU and because of what groups in the EU are trying to do to get them out. And we succeeded. And just this past couple of weeks, we've taken them back to Africa to Shamwari in South Africa where they can live free and for the remainder of their lives in a more natural place. And I think uh, the question may not be whether the EU or the US or some other government is leading, it's whether we can all lead together. And obviously the more work we can do together, I think the better for animals. Thank you. So, dear colleagues and friends, dear students, uh, I would like first to thank the organizer of this important event for inviting me to speak today to you. It's an honor and a pleasure to speak about how much the EU uh, and the state members have accomplished in the last decades uh, because the EU has played an important role creating a frame of legislation in order to better protect animals. Um, by the way, my interest in legal status of animals goes back to my doctoral thesis, who um, treated about slaves, slaves when uh, slaves in, in, the, in the criminal procedure that was the same to animals. This is my, in my second life, this is uh, focused to study the legal status of animals. It's a current uh, development of this first interest. Today, I will refer, if only in summary form, to some aspects that hinder the recognition in the legal tests and court decisions that animals are sentient beings. Additionally, I will suggest what legal techniques can be used in the medium and long term for the law to recognize the sentience of animals in policy. Leaving as uh, the starting point uh, of my intervention a framework regulation of the condition of the animals, we will explore how aspects of European legislation and the member states are contributing to improving the condition of animals in recent decades. The law has always taken into account the changing social realities to suit them, to regulate them, ultimately to make it simple and easy life in society. From this point of view, it is clear that French society, its citizens, its intellectuals, its legislators have long been demanding a change in some areas covered by the civil code, which had become obsolete, and this has reflected in the recent law, 2015, 
1977 on 16th February 2015 on the modernization and simplification of the law and procedure in the field of justice and home affairs. The question that I want to emphasize today is the changing of the civil code regarding the legal status of animals, hitherto considered as in the rest of the rights codified, except for the negative rating of the animals as known things in Austria, Switzerland, Germany, and the Catalan civil code, as things in property. The new law has changed the article 515.14, with a new wording to complete the condition of animals as living beings endowed with sentience. The text now reads as follows. Les animaux sont des êtres vivants doués de sensibilité. This change is of great importance because positions animals as living beings, not comparable to inert things, different things in property, and human beings. Their ability to sentience, allowing them to enjoy and suffer, is more in line with what science is saying about animals as sentient beings. In the French term, gives autonomous legal status to the animals, être doué de sensibilité, être vivant. So, uh, in the aspect of the research and experimentation, the recent updates, it's necessary to highlight that the EU has given decisive support to the consideration of animals as sentient beings in their legislation on animal welfare. A clear example is the Directive uh, 2003-15EC regarding animal experimentation which is reflected in the Directive 76768EC, which prohibits experimentation on animals for cosmetic products, testing ban. This European regulation, which is since 2000, introduced in 2009, has included the sales ban on cosmetic products tested on animals, but was applied in Spain 10 years later. Let's consider for a moment what that change would signify, for example, in criminal law, where in cases of possible abuse, the current boundary for animal suffering is either immediate death or painful death, without specifying how pain can be measured, which determines the action is considered a misdemeanor or felony and how to respective sentences are applied when legislators are thinking of an animal as a thing, as a thing. Let's think on the contrary what will happen if in cases where an animal is a victim of abuse, the criminal code apply the evaluation of animal pain and suffering considering the animal to be a sentient being. Will they change some sentences today that are obviously too lenient and make them more appropriate? I leave the question open for discussion, both for jurists and for non-jurists. It is clear that legislation regarding animals must begin to become clearer and more precise. So, concerning animals in shows, it is important to point out that the Federation of Veterinary of Europe, the FIVI, which is a veterinary organization who represents 46 national veterinary organizations across 38 European countries and four vibrant sections from 38 European countries, who strives to promote animal health, animal welfare, and public health in all Europe, and who works to influence national, European, and even global institutions, has adopted on the 6th of June 2015, so some months ago, a very important paper for animal welfare called The Position of the Use of Animals in Traveling Circuses, 
which is fundamental for the destiny of thousands of animals still used in the circus, because in conclusion, FIDI formally recommends all European and national competent authorities to prohibit, to prohibit the use of wild mammals in traveling circuses across Europe, since there is by no means the possibility that their physiological, mental, and social requirements can adequately be met. Indeed, assuming that the paper starts from the logic point that the use of any animal species, including birds, reptiles, and domesticated species in any entertainment, traveling or otherwise, should be submitted to scientific and ethological considerations for animal welfare. The theory makes the related and decisive considerations about it. In effect, the theory observes that the use of wild mammals, especially elephants, big cats, lions, and tigers, in traveling circuses reflects a traditional but outdated view of wild animals. So, some countries, as has been said, uh, have banned animals in circuses in the last decade. So, Croatia, Belgium, Slovenia, Catalonia, Holland, Portugal, Denmark, Estonia. And it, in, it shows the, commit, the, committed, the commitment of uh, European countries to stop this use of animals in circuses, especially in spectacles. So, speaking about the role of the courts in Europe, other aspect, um, under my point of view, very important, the role of the courts in the protection of animals is increasingly important and most influential time by time. The judges are ones who are changing the animal law in favor of interest of the animal's interpretation, even though they are the obstacle in most European countries, that the animals are things, goods for the benefit of human beings, and this requires them to render decisions in consideration to the economic value of animals concerned. However, I will highlight just a few court decisions that show this tendency of European courts to open the way to better treatment of animals. For example, concerning seals and the European Court, the Superior European Court of the EU. The European Union was concerned about the animal welfare aspects of the seal hunt. Doubts have been expressed about some of the methods used for hunting seals such as shooting, netting, and clubbing, that can cause avoidable pain and distress. Several EU member states were considering or had already introduced national legislative measures to ban the import and use of seal skins and seal products. In the light of these concerns, on 16 September 2009, the European Parliament and the Council adopted a regulation banning the trade of seal products in the European Union. It applies to seal products produced in the EU and to imported products. Well, recently, this is the really important um, point that I, I, I would highlight. Recently, the Court of Justice of the European Union has refused the appeal of the Inuit Tapirit Kanatami against the ban of seal trade products. The regulation, so Inuit Tapirit Kanatami is an association which represents the interest of Canadian Inuits. Well, the regulation by its judgment of 25 of April 2013, the General Court dismissed the action brought by Inuit Tapiri Kanatami and the other associations and individuals. Other aspects to be um, stressed are the dolphins. 
the Italian Supreme Court, Corte di Cassazione, on the 24th September 2013, deposited the sentence about the confiscation of the four dolphins that had been carried away from the Rimini Dolphinarium from the Italian Environmental Police, Corpo Forestale dello Stato, the Rimini Public Prosecutor in the August 2013, confirmed the confiscation of the animal, what, what was the first time in Europe we talk about mistreatment of dolphins in a private structure. Regarding beagles, beagles, the 23rd January, the Italian Penal Tribunal of Brescia, on the initiation of LAV, Italian ONG, who works for animal rights, had convicted three people, the president of Green Hill, 2001, a big factory of beagles, addressed to Vivi section and the veterinary of the structure. At one year and a half, of detention and the general director of one year of detention for mistreatment of the 2,637 beagles. They were breeding and for illegal killing of 44 beagles. The judge also decided the confiscation of all animals that now are living in many families in Italy and for the suspension of two years of the activity of farm animals. Well, so, very important of the role of the courts, this is relative to horses. In December 2012, in Mallorca, the owner of Sorki Das Pond, a horse used for raising, hit it repeatedly with a stick to death. The man was sentenced in May 2015 to eight months in prison for killing the animal plus a penalty of disqualification of three years to exercise any occupation related to animals. The convict Ask it the jail will be suspended or replaced at no criminal record. The Balearic Association of Lawyers for the Right of Animals, ABADA, opposed the request, which was finally rejected by the judge of the criminal court number no. eight of Palma. It will be the first person convicted of a crime of animal abuse in Spain that meets the sentence in prison. Greyhounds, pardon, so greyhounds are, oh, the hounds are, have disappeared. So greyhounds um, are used in Spain for hunting. This is a tradition to use the, in, in the season of, uh, of hunting, to use greyhounds, not for sports, so for, for hunting. And this is explained, I, I know that this is not the habit here in the US, but it explain what I am I'm going to say. The precarious situation of greyhounds, both during and after the hunting season, is much visible in February, when the hunting season is closed. And the more than 50,000 licensed hunters consider whether or not the greyhound hat that has accompanied them through the season is good enough for the next season. If the greyhound is too dirty for the hunt, that is to say that the dog no longer serves to chase the hare, they get rid of the dog with cruel methods, such as hanging, abandonment, death. In a well, actions which are not reported most times and which rarely receive the punishment that they deserve. So the exception is that the perpetrator of a hanging of two greyhounds received for the first time the criminal sentence in October 2013 in Toledo. Well, I would like to, for the, because 
So companion animals, some challenges about good findings that maybe are for interest for you all. Bullfighting is suffering the opposition of, to, of the opposition of the a mainly part, so a, a big part of the society in Spain. The, the, the defense of the maintaining of bullfighting is based on the use of tradition as an, as an element of justification. However, there are already many criticisms against these bloody spectacles that mobilize our society and have led to the suspension of government subsidies to keep by many municipalities and local governments. This is a very important point. So without subsidies, it is impossible that bullfighting can survive. Some examples. The campaign Mallorca Without Blood has achieved 135,000 signatures in support of the ban, and 24 municipalities have already been declared anti-bullfighting. In addition, 13 other municipalities are about to join. After the Canary Island and Catalonia, the Balearic Island is the third autonomous region to ban bullfighting. Tradition, or the association of a particular celebration with national identity, cannot be brandished as a safe word to perpetuate practices in which animals are abused. Bullfighting requires the brutal sacrifice of a living animal, and for this very reason, is unacceptable. However, aesthetically pleasing it may be regarded. I would like to recall the warning regarding tradition that was issued by the Supreme Court of Valencia in connection with the release of tax in the harbor of Sagunto, which had been taking place in spite of a few fines. The court declared that no tradition can serve as excuse to give a natural treatment to the ducks. We begin to see a trend in jurisprudence which is ever more clearly in favor of respectful treatment toward animals. We are still far from defending their interest, as has been done in other countries, where the nation has penetrated the law as well as the awareness of the citizens. But there are moments in history, and this is one of them, that mark a point of no return. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Uh, I think we have time for a few questions, if anyone has any thing burning on the back of their mind. That's, uh... I'm sorry. Yes, it's your question. So the, so the question is whether uh, the European Union collectively uh, helps animals more or, or whether it might also hinder them uh, compared to taking action at the individual member state level. Um, it's a good question. I think the short answer is I'm fairly optimistic that it's 
that's both, that individual member states, when they have the latitude to take stricter measures than what European policy might allow, will do so. And I think you saw that in some of the slides just now, that you know, there are some member states that will ban circuses, while maybe not all of them have. So you have the ability for the individuals to act within the overall EU policy, but obviously having a strong EU policy being directed down to the member states at least is going to raise the bar quite a bit throughout. And then the question, as I mentioned in my talk, is it's all about enforcement and understanding. So I, I I think, I think I'm optimistic on both ends, that you can have strong EU-wide policies that at least raise the minimum standard for animals throughout all the member states, and then individual member states will act as they can to have higher standards than that. So I think uh, some member states are more in, in so also depends of the procedure to incorporate the legislation, the frame legislation of the EU in each member state. For example, Germany incorporate uh, directly as proper law, so the directives and the general uh, frame law of the EU. Uh, in the case of Spain, so should be submitted to the parliament. That is explained that the, um, after 10 years of the publication of the directive about experimentation, Spain adopted so the, 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 the measures that were an obligation. For example, in the case of uh, chickens, battery cages, also uh, so we have observed differences in, 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 in the countries until so the, the 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 commission said it is about uh, 2000, uh, 2012 first january of 2012 that should be disappeared the battery cages for for chickens as it depends from the tradition and also from the interior law of uh, the domestic law of each country Uh, in the middle there. The question is, what is the citation for the quote about subsidiarity and proportionality? I could say something right now thinking that no one else would know that if I'm right or not. But um, no, I don't. But if you email me, I can find out and get it to you. We can do a couple more if anyone has anything. OK. Well, I think that's it then. Um, if we could get a round of applause for our panelists today. They did a great job. Good job. And when, with this wonderful panel, we now conclude the conference for this year. And I want to thank all of you for being here. And of course, our wonderful speakers, thank you so much. Um, as some of you know, every third year, we take the conference on the road. And next year is that third year. So we're going to be taking the conference on the road. We're not quite sure exactly where it's going to be, um, but we're close to making <laughs> New York. New York. Um, but we will know soon. And uh, so keep your eyes open. And you can always go to animallawconference.org to get that information. Or you can go to our website at the Center for Animal Law Studies or ALDF's website. And we will get that information as soon as possible. We hope to see you next year. And in the meantime, enjoy the rest of this beautiful Oregonian afternoon. And if you've come here from someplace else, safe travels home. And thank you again for, for being here with us.
If anyone is dashing to the shuttle, it's going to be at the flag stop across the street and it's leaving in less than 10 minutes. Thank you. 
that you need? I don't think so, other than, yeah, other than you guys just grabbing, grabbing the stuff. So I think, I don't know if this one stays in here, or do you huh? take that one back? Oh, okay. Yeah. Thank you. 